All right, welcome in. The Madness is off and running here on this Tuesday in college uh, basketballs. We've already got uh, one game in the books in the Atlantic 10. We got a couple of games going on. Big 12, ACC here. Uh, we got another Atlantic 10 getting ready to go off. So a lot of early hoops here today as conference tournaments are uh, are in the know right now. We've got three guys that are going to help us Break down a few of these games coming up a little bit later today and three of the best at wagertalk.com. When it comes to college basketball, double R1L in the house. Look, he's so good. He's got not one, but two pens. He's throwing up at us here, Ralph Michaels. And $2 of course, $2 Tuesday. <laughs> Tuesday, $2 pen, you name it. Uh, Rob Vino in the house. See, Vino. You don't even have to do any math today. We got two guys uh, that'll do it for you here. So it's fantastic stuff. Uh, gentlemen, uh, welcome in. A lot going on here uh, with conference tournament time. But Ralph, since you are the $2 handicapper here today, and we also happen to be kicking off uh, this conference uh, conference tournament time here with some of the big boys, uh, you have a chart, I believe, that uh, that is very... Uh, very relevant and very now with what's going on. So why don't you, uh, not that chart, the other chart. Let's go conference tournament fade. There you go. Ralph, uh, tell us, I know you went over this on Wager Talk uh, today here, but I think it's pretty good for those uh, tuning into the college basketball tip-off show. Some interesting uh, numbers on this chart, Ralph. Well, this is the last three years, conference tournaments, and these are what the favorites have done. So, you know, you take a look and there's a lot of green on the left-hand side, the ATS numbers for the last three years. But take a look at the very bottom, the Big 12, 48, the Big East, 38, the Big 10, 37%. What stands out about those three? Well, guess what? Ken Palm has those three conferences as the three toughest college basketball conferences. Guess what? We're probably going to have 20 maybe 25 teams from those three conferences in the NCAA tournament. So those favorites don't need to win at all. You're sitting in the four or five seed. You probably already have your ticket to the big dance. So look at the top of the chart, the, the Missouri Valley, CUSA, MEAC, West Coast, A-10, A A American East. Those conferences are more likely than not a one team or a two team conference. So keep that in mind as we go into this week and those big conferences. If you don't have to win those games, there's sometimes coaches don't want to play five straight days and be tired going into that Thursday game. And those bigger conferences is when you have to pull out those scenarios. Interesting uh, numbers there. And of course, uh, guys, uh, you can have uh, access to that chart. I'm sure it will show up on Ralph's uh, Twitter page at some particular point here during the day. Make sure you check that out because it certainly is interesting as conference tournaments are off and running and we're going to kick off one of the late ones here tonight for a big game breakdown with double r one l steve merrill ready to roll here with conference tournament time and merrill you going out west and uh we're going to be talking south dakota state the jackrabbits taking on uh the denver pioneers with a nice uh win there last night and uh, this game uh, is Summit League Championship here. One of these teams is punching their ticket here, Merrill. Which one do you think it might be tonight? Yeah, we're going to look at this national TV game at 930 Eastern on CBS Sports Network. It is the Summit League Championship game. Not, not necessarily the two highest profile teams on the board, but it's as, as important as any game because it is a win and get in, go home otherwise for these two squads. And South Dakota State's going to get the win in this one. It really comes down to do they cover uh, win by more than 10 points. I think they do, but I also want to look at the total in this game as well. I would lean South Dakota State. They've won nine of the 10 over the last several seasons in the series. They are obviously the dominant team, and it's also a tough spot for Denver as the underdog. Coming off back-to-back straight-up underdog wins, they were a six-point dog on Saturday, and then they were a pick -em on uh, Sunday, actually on Friday and Sunday. And uh, this looks like a difficult situation here. I'm sorry, Saturday and Monday. Today is Tuesday. I'm already confused. March mm -hmm. Madness is thrown off my calendar. But the point is, mm -hmm. they're lucky to be in the finals, whereas South Dakota State's had an easier road, uh, easy 16-point win on their Saturday game, and then a 10-point win uh, last night. So I look for them to be the more rested team. Denver likes to play extremely fast 
And I just don't think that's going to work having your third game in four nights. This is not something college kids are used to. I know the NBA teams do it, but these are college kids who are not used to it. And I really think it hurts a team that likes to play fast when they're playing unrested in third time in four nights. So I like South Dakota State here, minus a 10. And by the way, the only game they've lost in those last 10, and I mentioned they're 9-1 straight up, was a bit of a misleading loss. It was earlier this season, Jack, January 13th at Denver. They lost by 19 points as a road favorite, three-and-a-half-point road favorite. But as is often the case, it was extreme three-point shooting for the upset for Denver. They made 14 of 29. South Dakota State only made six. So that means Denver was plus 24 points from three mm. in that 19-point home win upset. And as expected, South Dakota State got their revenge a month later on February 22nd, won easily the most recent meeting by 27 at home as a nine-point favorite. I think they went in double-digit range tonight. I would also lean towards the under. Both teams like up-tempo, but as I mentioned, third game in four nights, back-to-back, -back, no rest situation. I don't think that pace is going to work as well, especially for the underdog. And we've seen a massive move on this total. It opened as high as 163, down to 155 and a half. So I like the favorite. And I like the under at 930 Eastern. And don't forget, my top play tonight comes in the NBA. I also have a free NBA play. So two NBA plays tonight, a best bet and a bonus free play. Steve Merrill, wagertalk.com. All right, good stuff there. Summit League Championship uh, coming up a little bit later here tonight as we welcome in the pen, Ralph Michaels. Uh, $2 handicapper here today, Ralph, which if I'm not mistaken means... Uh, you've got a, is it a 5% best bet locked and loaded for $2 up at wagertalk.com? It is, Joe. I've been number one at wagertalk in March, two of the last three years. I've cashed six straight March 5% college basketball plays. And I, I don't think it's considered cherry picking when you're saying, okay, well, why one month does it matter? Well, because conference tournaments and March Madness are such a different animal relative to the college basketball regular season that I think it's very important to pull that data out and specifically point it out. So the databases I use, the, 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 the tracking I do with these conference tournaments, the charts I make, all that really has helped me have great success in conference and March Madness selections. Again, number one the last two years, a 5% college basketball play for two bucks tonight all right can't go wrong there ralph and uh you're gonna talk a uh, little acc action uh coming up a little bit later here today uh with uh the u miami taking on boston college now right away ralph when i saw this number come out this is interesting uh a i watched boston college beat miami not too long ago i also couldn't tell you who was president the last time miami feels like it won a game uh, but yet here we are at what one, one and a half, somewhere along those lines. It's an interesting number here, Ralph. What should we be thinking about the U taking on Boston College here today? Joe, when I went to the Miami newspaper this morning and in the search bar, I put freaking ugly. The Miami <laughs> offense showed up. <us. laughs> you know, Woo! you you want to talk <laughs> about some pitiful numbers. You know, I'm looking at Miami going back to. Uh, January 30th, in one, two, three, four, five games, they did not even top 37%. Um, mm. And yes, you, you look at the struggles. Now, they've only topped 45% twice since January 24th. The funny thing is, at Boston College, they shot 52.9%. That's the only game over 50% this calendar year. They also had their worst performance at home against Boston College, when they were a five and a half point favorite, they shot only 33.8%. Now, there's a good reason why Miami has struggled, and that's Nigel Pack has been out. He is most likely out. I talked to my Miami, uh, my Miami connection, who happens to be the mm -hmm. host of this game, and he says, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it seems that Pack is done for the year. That has not been officially announced. So, that's why this did not make my card. But if Pack does come back and play, this Miami team is completely different. But I look at the coaching here. Larinaga, remember, this Miami team was the number one seed last year, and they made it to the Final Four. When I have that type of coach in this reset mode, I do give them the edge. They've been beat up by Post. I mean, Post is a center that Larinaga called an NBA guy. He may not get drafted, but he's a guy that, 
He scored 19 points in their first meeting, 28 points in the other. And this guy is, I think, seven foot one. He has actually mm-hmm. gone six of 11 from three points. So it's a big guy. He doesn't beat you down. He stretches the court. So I don't expect him to have those kind of numbers in this game. When I look at the team as well and say, well, how can a team be favored after losing nine straight games? I went to the database and uh, we have a chart as well. But favorites, conference tournaments that have lost at least seven straight games, it's only happened nine times since 2016. Guess what? Those losing streak favorites have actually got 8 no straight up and obviously 8 no ATS if they're a favorite. So uh, a surprising number for me. And if you're really worried about backing teams in losing streaks, uh, you don't want to make that the crux of your, of your write-up or the reason. So take a look. Teams on a three-game losing streak going into the conference tournament have covered 61%. You look at teams that have lost exactly four straight, five straight, six straight, and you say, oh, my God, those are ugly numbers. Yes, they are ugly. But then it turns around, and teams on longer winning streaks, seven, eight, nine, and 10, are all 50% or better. So if you look at the very bottom, teams that come into the conference tournament with at least seven straight losses are 29 and 18, 61.7% against the spread. And we'll finish with this angle, Joe. Teams off back-to-back wins, like Boston College, with at least three days of rest, versus teams off back-to-back losses. Team win is a favorite or a dog, the uh, plus seven and a half. Those teams like Boston College are only 29.9%. So again, you think the hotter team is a positive? This system is just the opposite. Back-to-back teams, teams off back-to-back losses versus teams off back-to-back wins in this role, over 70% with the Miami Hurricanes. So I will back Miami. If I hear Pack is in later tonight, I'll turn it into a play. If I hear Pack has a chance to come back if they get the win, I will have my eyes on those Hurricanes. All right. Uh, them just being a favorite should uh, should tell you a lot about what the market thinks of uh, Boston College. That's for sure here. All right. So uh, we've got a little ACC here now. We talk Summit. It's time to bring in our good friend Rob Vino. He's going to head out west. And Vino, it's the matchup we've all been waiting for. It feels like Groundhog's Day. What a shock. St. Mary's taking on Gonzaga in the West Coast Conference. Uh, I mean, it's exactly what we thought would happen. Both teams handled business last night uh, without much issue. Uh, here we go again. Zag St. Mary's, Vino. Break it down for us. How are you leaning in this one here? Yeah, like I heard last night, 26 26- straight seasons that Gonzaga has been in this game. That's absolutely crazy. Um, But here they are, like you say, Joe, the two that you would expect to be here every year. A couple others think they have a chance. They find out they have no chance. So let's take a look at this one. Um, Two games during the regular season. They go one and one. Each team wins on the other team's home court. So obviously Mm. venue doesn't bother anybody here. Um, It's interesting to note that through Ken Palm, you find out that those two games, each had exactly 59 possessions, which mm. we were talking about horse and buggy rides before. That's about the equivalent, 59 possessions to a horse and buggy ride. Very, very slow. Um, Gonzaga doesn't like to play that way, but they haven't minded playing that way against this team. Gonzaga led both games at halftime, 34-33 at home, 44-28 at St. Mary's just 10 days ago where St. Mary's was looking to go 16-0 and in the WCC and did not get there. Gonzaga rained on that parade. So, um, you know, the first game, Gonzaga led by three with 10 minutes left. They collapsed in the end, only scored seven points, final nine and a half minutes, unlike them. But the second time around, they didn't collapse. They held on and played pretty strong. And here's some things I took from the first two games that I think that are important to note that could lead you to a play on Gonzaga tonight. If you just look at the combined numbers, In both games, for these two teams from two-point field goal range, Gonzaga shot 51.1% from two, 46 of 90. The other side only shot 41% from two, 32 of 78. That's a 10.1% margin, which is huge. 
Um, obviously, Gonzaga is a great interior scoring team. I think they're second in the nation in points scored um, inside the arc, 49 points. But that number right there, plus 10.1, I think is important in a game like this where you figure it's going to be slowed down and possessions are going to be meaningful. And then I looked at the free throw line. And, and it's interesting that these two teams, when they play, it's so slow. There's no free throws. In the second mm. game, they both made five free throws, five of six, five of nine. But the combined numbers from the free throw line, Gonzaga shot at 76.2. The other side, St. Mary's 54.5. That's a 21.6% margin. Could call it an outlier. I'm not so sure it's an outlier. One team's a better foul shooting team than the other. The one team gets the right guys to the line. The other team doesn't. So two big edges when you're talking about two-point shots and free throws in a conference tournament championship game. Um, the game that St. Mary's won by two points, where they rallied in the end um, the last nine and a half minutes, they're starting forward. Joshua Jefferson was a big, big piece of that game. Um, he had a double-double there, 16 points, 10 rebounds. He's one of their most versatile players. Top four in like five different offensive categories on this team. He played in that game. He didn't play in the second game. He's out for the season. In the second game, St. Mary's got whacked by 13 at home. So you could come to the conclusion that he was an important piece that they don't have anymore. And maybe against this team, they can't survive his absence. Um, ultimately, to me, Gonzaga was the more consistent team in both of those games. They've been on fire as of late offensively. And I guess we have to preface it by saying, hey, the WCC has some pretty poor teams in it. But mm. when you shoot 50.7, between 50.7%, and 66.1% in seven straight games. I don't care who the opponents are. This team's making shots, plenty of them. Five of those seven straight games, they've hit better than 40% from three, which is another good aspect here. Um, they're good inside the arc. They're good at the free throw line. And to me, St. Mary's is just a little too dependent upon the three-point shot here. I think Gonzaga's the better team. I checked real quick um, when I was uh, – putting these notes together and they're both listed as potential seven seeds in the tournament mm. today. Um, whichever one wins probably climbs to a five because it's a big win. I think Gonzaga is probably that team. Even if they can't speed this thing up, Joe, they've shown the first two that they're comfortable playing this way. So I think Gonzaga, it's been pushed from two and a half to three and a half, maybe not a 13 point win here, but all we need is to win by four. So I'll take Gonzaga minus three and a half. All right, liking the Zags. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Here we go here, uh, off and running with conference tournaments, guys. The madness is upon us here. But if you head over to wagertalk.com, you can go visit Ralph's page, $2 handicap year today, 5% best bet up and available. Steve Merrill and Rob Vino, both with their best bets locked and loaded. And do not miss a uh, any of these upcoming big game previews and other best bets that we have for you on Wager Talk TV here on our YouTube channel. And uh, if you're joining us for the first time, hit that subscribe button. Get notified when these videos get posted. Hit that like button here as well. We certainly appreciate the support as we get ready for not one, not two, but three best bets here uh, coming your way in games tonight. We'll start. Back up at the top with double R1L. And how did I know the best bet was coming from this conference here, Merrill? Uh, there might be a prop or a sweatshirt or something coming up over here for you. But you're going to be looking at the CAA championship. Uh, what a shocker here, Merrill. Stony Brook and College of Charleston. But maybe the shocker is that Stony Brook is in this game here tonight. Forgot I had a sweatshirt prop. I appreciate the reminder. Yes, there it is. Yay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no longer the Colonial <laughs> Coastal. It's a bigger conference. It's a bigger and worse conference than it's ever been in history with 14 teams. And that is the truth. We're going to look at a free play in that game. A quick reminder, I've got a strong NBA best bet tonight for my clients at wagertalk.com. Back-to-back sweeps on Sunday and Monday night in the NBA. We're talking college hoops. It is March Madness, but the NBA continues to cash. Also, a bonus free NBA play on my page for Monday night. And don't miss out on the special promo code as well. Steve Merrill, wagertalk.com. Let's look at the CAA championship game tonight, 7 o'clock Eastern. The line has gone from 8.5 to 10. Money's coming actually 7.5 to about 9.5, 10 on College of Charleston. So they are going to win this game. I actually would lean Stony Brook on the side 
Uh, this is one of the best money makers in sports this year. They're 23 and eight against the spread. Stony Brook is. They lost by six as a six point dog in the one meeting back in January. But Charleston was plus 15 points from three point range, only one by six. So I would lean towards Stony Brook on the dog side on the side. But I think the total, as you see on the screen, is the best play. And I like under 149 and a half. Heavy early sharp money on the total under here. It opened as high as 156 and a half. That was a bad number because this is not a regular season game. The odds makers got sucked into the fact that Charleston loves to play extremely fast. Stony Brook usually plays up tempo with those type of teams. And that is exactly what we saw on that January 6th meeting earlier this season when Charleston won 93-87, 180 points, easily went over the total of 152 and a half. So what do they do? They bump this one a few baskets higher, but it's a mistake because this is not a regular season game. It's a conference championship. We're going to get more defensive intensity in a championship game. But the biggest reason it was a mistake is because these teams are fatigued, especially Stony Brook. They're the seventh seed. They had to play the extra game on Saturday. They beat Northeastern as a one-point favorite. Then they upset both the three and two seeds, Drexel and Hofstra, the last two days on Sunday and Monday. And now they're playing their fourth game in four nights without rest. They need to slow things down. And they are capable of playing pretty good half-court defense when needed. They're not a bad defensive team this season. In fact, they rate as a better defensive team than Charleston. Charleston has to play fast, but this is now their third game in three nights with no rest. And they had a scrappy win last night, a non-covering win against Towson. And if you watched Wager Talk today on Monday, I gave out Towson plus the six to six and a half as a free play on that show because Towson plays at one of the 10 slowest paces in the country. And I knew that would slow the game down, give the dog a chance. So Charleston had a scrappy win last night. I think this game doesn't necessarily go down to the wire. I do think Stony Brook stays within single digits. Charleston advances to the tournament for the second year, but the under is the way to play it. Plenty of wiggle room still here under 149 and a half. That's at 7 Eastern on CBS Sports Network. And a quick reminder, if you're loving this content on Wager Talk TV, click subscribe and click the bell for instant alerts when these free play videos go up throughout the week. And also comment below. I read all the comments. I reply back. Thumbs up, like. And I've got a strong NBA best bet and a bonus free NBA play tonight on Tuesday on my page, Steve Merrill, wagertalk.com. Yeah, he certainly does. Very stalkish in that way of answering back uh, the comments here, folks. Just want you to know that. So don't be alarmed here. Double R, what else? Steve Merrill. Rob Vino, what is going on here, Rob Vino? Uh, We've got uh, another interesting game here for you tonight in a best bet. And... uh, well, it's smart. FIU, huh? Uh, they gotten some buzz down here, certainly since Miami hasn't won a game here. A lot of people have been talking about this team. We know they can score. Can they get enough stops to beat Jacksonville State here tonight? How are you approaching this for a best game? Now, you know better than that, Joe. <laughs> Not getting any <laughs> stops is great for me <laughs> whenever that happens. Um, we're going to take a look at this game over. When I... Uh, uh, submitted it to the production crew. It was 141 and a half since been bumped up to 142. Still, oh, think yeah. there's enough room there. Let's take a look. It actually opened at 140 and a half now up to 142. Um, the first game these two teams played 70 to 63, 133, uh, not over this given number tonight of 142. But the second game, the more recent game that was played, 77, 75, 152 points, that would work here. FIU. In those two games, they're a poor defensive team, as you mentioned, Joe. Uh, But they had no answer for Jacksonville's top player, Kyle Tandy. Star guard had 55 points in two games. I don't know what changes for him in this one. And let's just look at all the ways that this would figure to be an up-and-down offensive style of game. First off, FIU, high-tempo team, number two in CUSA play, number 45 across the nation in adjusted offensive tempo. But what really sticks out is their average length of possession on each side of the floor. It's rapid fire on both ends. They shoot it quick. They let you shoot it quick. They're number 54, the quickest offensive length of possession in the country. They're 61st on the defensive end. They'll let you go quick, too, so you get a little bit of up and down. Um, The fact that they played Jacksonville State in their own building and Jacksonville State was willing to go ahead and run with them was a 71 possession game and win that game 75 to 70, uh, 77 to 75, excuse me. It kind of signals to me 
that JSU is not afraid. Even though it's not their cup of tea to play fast, they did it against Florida International. They went to their building. They played their style. They beat them by two. So I don't think they're afraid to do it again here now that they've seen they can beat them. Um, FIU currently on a 6-0 and over streak. Every single one of those six games went over 142. Jacksonville State on a 4-1 and over run as well. Three of those four hit 144 plus. So we've got teams that are showing offensive um, capability here late in the year. And one more thing about Jacksonville State, when you really dig into their results conference-wise, when they played the quicker teams, they played quick with them. Go back and look at UTEP games. Go back and look at Western Kentucky games, two teams that go really fast. And JSU went right with them. So I think they'll try and do that here. The one big thing in these two meetings for Jacksonville State, and the reason why they won them both, is their rebounding edge is beyond significant substantial, mm. whatever you want to use. It's beyond that. Um, they had 30 offensive rebounds in the two games. But if you look at the percentage of offensive rebounds they got off of their shots, in other words, every time they put up a shot, how often did they rebound it and get a second chance? First time, it was 45% of the time. Shoot it, get it back, shoot it again, get it back, shoot it again. Second game, it was 41%. So it's no... Um, it's no mirage that they were able to kill the offensive boards against FIU provides plenty of close opportunities here. I could see it happen again, second chance opportunities. And again, FIU just plays terrible defense last in adjusted defensive efficiency in that league. They have one strength FIU because they play so fast for steals or get steals force turnovers against Jacksonville state. They were able to do it because Jacksonville state doesn't handle the ball all that well. 34 takeaways by FIU in those two games. So, again, you got a pretty good hand-and-glove match here for scoring opportunities. I think I agree with the fact that it's going from 140 and a half up to 142. Um, the FIU games obviously accumulate plenty of scoring opportunities. We should see it again. First game, they shot 3 of 17. That's 17% from 3. Got to 63 points. All they did was push that up to 31% in the second game, close to 32 and all of a sudden, they got to 75. Anywhere in between probably gets them to 70 here. They've scored 70 plus in five straight. I think it's helpful and something to look at here in these games. And we, we're seeing it again this year quite a bit. These second half overs are crazy. Because if mm. you're behind anywhere like eight or nine points in the last 90 seconds, these games are getting stretched and stretched. Games that have no reason no um chance to get over the number yep. are getting over the number because of the multiple multiple opportunities you get between free throws shots on the other end more free throws shots on the other end this time of year when it's win or go home for a lot of these teams that's what happens this game is lined at minus four and a half kind of suggests that we'll have a close game at the end lots of opportunities last 90 seconds i think you know 142 is a doable number Last game got to 152, so we're going to try it that way. Best bet for the show, Joe. Florida International, Jacksonville State, up and over 142. Uh, you know, I'll just add this to in this game, uh, Rob, because it's a running joke uh, down here in South Florida uh, because I'm pretty sure FIU didn't win one league game outside of the 305 area code this year, and they're in Huntsville right now for this game. Uh, which I believe has got to be pretty close to where, you know, this isn't Jacksonville State, Florida. This is Jacksonville State, Alabama. So the crowd's certainly going to be one-sided as the Conference USA tournament off and running here. But FIU, not great uh, in league play outside of the city of Miami. They are in Huntsville, Alabama here for the tournament tonight. All right, that leaves us with one other best bet here. And as a bonus here, Ralph uh, is going to give you the best bet. He's going to remind you about that uh, $2 Tuesday play he's got. And I'm going to throw and bust out a pen here, and I'm going to give Ralph a little uh, a little TNA as soon as he's done. So, Ralph, tell us, man, best bet-wise here today, where are you looking on the board? Joe, before I get to the best bet, Every time I, I'm on a show with Merrill, I have to work because of him. And here's another reason. So <laughs> Steve made Steve made a great point. Uh, I'm going to jump back to Steve's game. Steve made a great point about conference tournament finals being a different intensity. If you blindly 
played every conference tournament final since 2016. The over-under record is 117 and 161. That is 58% to the under, just blindly betting every conference tournament. So friends don't let friends bet conference tournament games over the total. I'm not going to say you're going to bet all the unders, but Steve, I just wanted to uh, compliment that point and, and quantify it for our viewers. My best bet is an actual 2% client release today on Montana. I released it at six and a half, and you see that it did climb to seven. But I do want to say this. I did only make it a 2% because we have one of the most unusual uh, conference tournament scheduling situations you'll find. It's not very often that you find a higher seed playing with no rest against a lower seed that actually has rest. The Big Sky went to their coaches and and their ADs a couple years ago and said, hey, listen, we want to change things up. So what happens is on Saturday, the four worst teams play. On Sunday, those teams play the number one and number two seed. So therefore, the number one and two seeds, if they win, get the next day off while the three and fours have to play back-to-back days. So it, 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 I, I like the situation and the mindset. But what happens is Idaho State uh, knocked off Northern Colorado two nights ago. So Montana is the three seed, and they played last night, while Idaho State off back-to-back wins has the off day. So there's not enough data to justify saying this is a positive, this is a negative. But the one thing that comes to mind is, if you're a March Madness team like Idaho State and you beat the number one, the number two seed, I would think you want to keep playing and have that positive momentum continue. Now you're off two wins. You have a whole day off. And what are those kids doing? They're in their hotel rooms going, oh, my God, if we beat Montana, the number two seed, then we can knock off the number one seed and maybe we go dancing. Now, when you look at the series history, uh, I went back to 2010. And series domination is one thing, but going back to 2010, Montana is 27 and one straight up against Idaho State. So that's a strong uh, hill to have to climb. They've also gone five and O straight up, and they've also gone five and O ATS the last five times they've played them. So you have a comfortable team with five seniors, one of the most experienced teams in the Grizzlies. Not only do they have five seniors. Three of them are three-year starters. One of them is a two-year starter. And the fifth starter started 28 games this year. So, again, we are talking experienced. I'm not worrying about them having to play yesterday. And then when I look up, excuse me, then when I look at, at the matchups in this game, the Bobcats went 6-2 and two as a small away favorite or, or, or a small dog this year. And the Bobcats, the last three games, have become uber efficient offensively. They've shot 50.9%, 60.4%, 52.9%. The Bengals, the Bengals didn't play a great game when they upset Northern Colorado. Northern Colorado was a banged-up team down the stretch and just didn't play well, period. They've shot only 46.8, 42.9, and 42.1% the last three games. Huge edge to Montana. And then the biggest matchup in this game is three-point shooting. Montana ranks number 34 in the country in three-point offense. Their defense is number 287, so not good. But while it's not good, Idaho State actually is worse on defense, number 305, and the offense only number 256. So massive three-point edge for Montana, series domination, an underdog that now is – thinking about how well they played and that they're only two games away from going to the big dance. That actually to me is a negative actual client release game. Number six thirty. Montana minus the points that tips off at 11 PM Eastern this evening. All right. Good stuff there. We got ourselves a couple of best bets, but uh, we're also not done because we have our friends from the gold sheet that uh, they, too, also have a best bet here tonight. And they're going to head up uh, north, way north. They're going to take a look at the Vermont game as they are taking on New Hampshire. And our good friends at the Gold Sheet think, 
All right. Two touchdowns. Way too much. 14 and a half right now as this thing has been getting bet up all morning long here. Uh, Vermont did close as a 10 and a half point home favorite less than a month ago. So they see absolutely no reason for the spread to be four points higher today. Also, Vermont just five and eight against the number as a home favorite this year. And two of Vermont's top contributors have been injured over the last few weeks. So when you put it all together, not a very uh, promising situation to be laying 14 and a half. So our friends from the Gold Sheet will be looking at taking those points with New Hampshire. And we encourage you guys uh, to head over to goldsheet.com and check out uh, the write-ups and the tools that they have. Knowledge is power. It's all about being a little bit smarter when making decisions and uh, having the right tools. And they certainly have them over at goldsheet.com. All right, so Ralph, on the way out of here, in honor of your $2 Tuesday 5% uh, best bet here, I did have a TNA for you, uh, which uh, was brought to my attention. And since the Big 12 is near and dear to my heart, and thank God I don't have to watch Oklahoma State play basketball anymore this season, which is fantastic that I do not have to be tortured here. But I will say this, Ralph, uh, straight out of uh, your database here, how about Big 12 tournament first round dogs heading into before Oklahoma State just lost uh, were 35 and 16 against the number since 2005. And how about this? 13 and two against the number since 2015. So this first round in the Big 12 over uh, over the last uh, decade plus here has been pretty profitable look at the dogs in the first round. I mention that because I think they're getting ready to tip off with Cincinnati and West Virginia, with West Virginia getting nine and a half or 10 in that spot, Ralph. So how was my pen action there, Ralph? Was that was that good with that, that, uh, that fact for you? Joe, there can only be one pen, but I'll tell you what. You can be Joe the Crayon Ranieri, so no problem with that. We do have a new nickname, and, uh, uh, you know. It, I want to be the marker, damn it. Go, I want to be the marker. Be, uh, listen, you got you to gotta go, you got to go crayon, go chalk, crayon, pencil, marker, pen. You got a long way to get to the uh, marker, bud, but uh, I, I, I got a lot. Uh, that's fine. I'm still taking West Virginia, Ralph, because if it ain't broke, don't fix it here. That's what I'm looking at. All right, guys, don't forget, best bets are locked and loaded. Ralph's got his uh, he's got his $2 Tuesday 5% best bet available. Rob Vino, locked and loaded, as is Merrily told you. Red Hot in the NBA has got a plate locked and loaded up there. Visit these guys over at wagertalk.com. Don't forget to hit the subscribe and the like button for us and make plans to come back and join us all week long here with the College Basketball Tip-Off Show. But don't go anywhere if it's more game previews and best bets you're looking for. Well, we've got them for you. Just click on that video on your screen right now and get access to all the big game previews and best bets that we have across all sports here at Wager Talk TV. Best of luck on your plays.